Father, thank you so much for all that you do for us. Thank you for your provision. Uh, we pray to recognize the ways that you provide for our lives. Um, they are subtle sometimes and huge in other ways, Lord. And we pray that from recognizing how good you are to us and how you are the center of our dependence, I pray that you help us to give to you out of that abundance, out of that understanding, and with great joy and great expectation that you can do amazing things with just a piece of what you've given me. Uh, we love you and thank you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> Okay, well today we walk into the second part of chapter 2, and I'm really excited to, uh, to dig into this scripture. Uh, we're actually going to cover this story in two parts, and uh, as I got into the study of it and uh, what we were going to be talking about, I think that we needed quite a bit of background information to kind of understand what's going on. So I'm just going to slow down a little bit and uh, work through this, but I'm going to read the whole story now, and uh, that way we have the big picture of what's going on. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple, with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers, and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple. And you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Father, thank you so much for this piece of scripture. I pray that you help us to better understand what you're saying here. I pray that you remove all obstacles and, and things that would distract us from hearing from you, Lord. I pray that you use me to speak your truth, Father. Uh, without you being involved, we're just talking and we're just listening. But with you involved, <laughs> miracles are happening right in front of us. We love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the writer of this gospel, as, as I like to point out and bring to memory, is the disciple whom Jesus loved. He identifies himself in John 21, 20 through 25, when Jesus is speaking with Peter about his role that's coming up. And Jesus looks back at this guy, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and says, what about him? And, and, and from that, the writer identifies himself as that man. He also identifies himself as the one who leans back upon the breast of Jesus in the upper room as he points out the one who's going to betray him. And that's in John 13, 21 through 26. So this was an intimate, close disciple of Jesus. Someone in his inner circle, someone who was with him before and after his resurrection. This is a trustworthy witness. The people he's writing to is a mainly Greek audience, somewhere between 55 and 95 AD. 
Uh, we could tell that he's writing to a very Greek audience by his constant clarification of Jewish language and customs. Um, this is not, however, to say that this letter is not for Jews um, and for people who were very familiar with the Jewish customs and background, but the writer surely keeps in mind Greeks and Gentiles as he addresses certain areas where separations in culture and language would definitely matter. So this writer is writing to a certain group of people, but he's also writing about a very specific time. He's writing about a Jewish people living in their own lands under captivity by Rome. They were called to be waiting on a Messiah who would free them, establish a kingdom, and its, 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 its borders would have no end, and its language would, it, it would not affect it. We know this from Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, among many other places, when it says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So this was an amazing message and truth for the Jewish people. Many of them respected and revered this promise in huge ways. You had this group of God-loving and God-fearing Jews who were studying the scripture, waiting in expectation of this Messiah, and waiting to be obedient and follow him. Though they didn't really know and understand everything that he would do, how he would do it, why he was doing it, they were believing, they were waiting, and they did recognize him because of these things. There was a, another group that had different reasons and expectations. This other group very well could have been caught up in sin. It's not hard for us to understand and accept that power, money, and religion can very often blind us from God's truth. This group very well could have been caught up in that reality. Some of them maybe didn't expect the Messiah to come back at all. And they would just continue to take advantage of their place within Rome. They had this this tiny piece of power, this, this kind of higher place than the rest of the Jewish people. And many of them thought that this Messiah is not coming back or, um, and we're just going to take advantage of this opportunity. Some of them probably did expect the Messiah to come back. But even in that, in some way, they expected him to come and serve their needs and their purposes and increase their power and their income. So it was not as if they were expecting this Messiah to come back and do what he came to do. They were expecting this Messiah to come back and do what they expected him to do. And, and, and that was maybe one of the things that kept them from seeing him. So we had this Jewish leadership who was dangling people's access to God and their ability to worship in front of them. And then we had this Roman rule who was dangling goodies to the Jewish leadership, trying to keep this Jewish people as a whole in line because they were a big group of people and had the potential to become very unruly. There was many uprisings within that time and place between the Jewish people and Rome. There were other times when dangling goodies didn't work and the, Rome, the Romans would brutally murder in prison and torture in order to keep control of the people. This was a hard time to be alive and living under captivity of Rome. The writer is very clear about his reason for writing in John 20, verse 31. And I'm going to repeat this one again and again throughout this whole gospel because I think we should memorize this and plant it in our heart. The purpose of the, right, of the beloved disciples' gospel is, the, is this. But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The reason for the gospel is belief that leads to life. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God and we have life in his name. We come to this passage after having just attended a wedding with Jesus. We see that this wedding has its place and purpose in God's gospel. It, it, it was not just some random event. It was not Jesus reacting to a situation. 
This, this miracle and sign had its purpose to the gospel writer. The purpose runs perfectly in line with his reason of writing. In the first chapter of the gospel, we are given a great description of John 1, 1 through 18. We're given a description of Jesus in John 1, 1 through 18. The eternal word through whom and by whom all things are created, who became flesh, dwelt among us, to be the light leading to life and to bear the direct image of the Father to the world so that we could recognize Him, believe, and have life sharing in His glory and truth. This Messiah was given a forerunner. That forerunner's name was John the Baptist and he came baptizing with water so that he could recognize the Messiah and then begin to point other people to Him so that they could recognize Him and begin to follow Him as well. So we see John the Baptist start to point Jesus out as this person. The people begin to recognize him. And within the story in John 1, 19 through 51, we see the early disciples of Jesus start to follow him as their rabbi. At the wedding, we get to see a great miracle of recognition of who Jesus is, give birth to start believing in his name. This is when we get to start seeing that transition take place. The ultimate result of this great sign was his disciples believing in him. John 2, 11 says the beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. And this wedding kind of kicks off our own engagement announcement to our bridegroom. We begin our own betrothal period with Jesus. He begins to betroth his church us. The text continues in John 2.12 and says, After this, he went down to Capernaum and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. There has been much discussion over who these brothers are, um, where did they come from, how did they get here. Many like to say that Mary remained a virgin her entire life. So these brothers become a real issue to that understanding and ideology. But let's just talk about the the reality of the situation. Is Mary did not have to remain a virgin after she had Jesus. She had to be a virgin when she had Jesus. So there was at least 12 years of her life after Jesus was born. Um, We know that that Jesus' father was alive at least 12 years because he's recorded in Luke 2, 41 through 51, when they traveled down to Jerusalem and Jesus kind of, gets lost and ends up in his father's house. Um, So that would leave 12 years of childbearing after the birth of Jesus, which leaves plenty of room for brothers and sisters. Um, It is not necessary for Mary to remain a virgin after she has Jesus. Um, So I, I think that it becomes very clear the dangers of adding to Scripture and not letting Scripture speak alone when we start to look at some of the doctrines that have arised out of this. I see this as a natural end to the story of John 2, 1 through 11. After this refers to after the wedding and the beginning of his signs. And it connects itself to the wedding. So we can only justify applying our timetable as scripture defines it. This means that after they stayed in Capernaum a few days, we don't really know how much time has passed before the next event or even if the next event in, the, in this fourth gospel is the next chronological event in the ministry of Jesus. It very well could be. Um, but we have to keep in mind that the purpose of the writer is not chronological. He's writing signs so that we may recognize and believe Jesus and have life in his name. While this idea doesn't disqualify the possibility of him, writing, of, of, of him writing about the next chronological stop in the ministry. Um, this would be the two temple cleansings understanding of Scripture. And, and I think that this makes a lot of sense. Um, we'll get to it a little down the line. But it displays a reality that in this time and context, Jewish writing and writers did not think of or write about time in the way that we understand it today, especially as it comes to storytelling and writing. But let's look at what Jesus does before we talk about the number of times he does it. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus, 
went up to Jerusalem. So what is Passover? Why did Jesus have to go up to Jerusalem to celebrate this Passover? Well, Passover is a celebration of the last of ten plagues that God used to free his people from Egypt, right? So the, the angel went through, and if these Jewish people had the blood of the lamb smeared on their doorposts and lintel, the angel would pass over their house and not take their firstborn child and firstborn of their livestock. However, if this blood was not on your house, he would. Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 8 spells out the yearly ceremony that arose from this great plague. Observe the month of Abib and celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. You shall sacrifice the Passover to the Lord your God from the flock of the herd in the place where the Lord chooses to establish his name. You shall not eat leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat with it unleavened bread, the bread of affliction, for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, so that you may remember all the days of your life, the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. For seven days no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory, and none of the flesh which you sacrifice on the evening of the first day shall remain overnight until morning. You are not allowed to sacrifice this Passover in any of your towns which the Lord your God has given you. But at the place where the Lord your God chooses to establish his name, you shall sacrifice the Passover in the evening at sunset at the time that you came out of Egypt. You shall cook and eat it in the place which the Lord your God chooses. In the morning you are to return to your tents. Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work on it. So God establishes that this Passover is to take um, place in not just a very specific way, but also a very specific location. It says, but at the place where, you, where the Lord your God chooses to establish his name. At this time, the place where the Lord God had established his name, or at least the place where they were doing these sacrifices and these offerings was the temple that Herod was rebuilding. It was in the final stages of rebuilding when Jesus was walking the earth. But this was not the first temple. This was not the first dwelling place of God. We see the Lord establish his name in the tabernacle. He resided there in full glory in the midst of the Jewish people in the wilderness. Um, we have a hard time, or I know I do, connecting to God being in a physical location. What, what would it be like for God to be in a building? Exodus 40, 34 through 38 describes the presence of God filling the tabernacle as Moses finished building the tabernacle just as God told him to. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. This was a place that didn't need locks, right? I mean, people came to this place and they knew what was going on. There was fire, a pillar of fire over it at night and a cloud over it by day. When the cloud was in it, people did not go in there. The glory of the Lord filled the tent. You would die if you came in contact with this in an impure and improper way. This was to be taken extremely seriously. I think it's also very beautiful to understand the, the presence of God being there giving them shade by day and protection by night. There are so many elements of this story of God's presence, its reality, its purposes, the way it serves us in, in ways we just don't deserve and can't understand. It would take us a long time to, to get through all that. But we're going we're gonna to move forward. At the point of God living 
and residing in the tabernacle, the people of Israel were constantly on the move. They would ultimately cross over into the promised land and the tabernacle would be placed in Shiloh as described in 1 Samuel 1.3. And eventually they would establish a physical temple under the rule of King David's son Solomon. 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3 paints a picture of the Lord taking up residence in this temple when it says, Now when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. The priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. All of the sons of Israel, seeing the fire come down, and the glory of the Lord upon the house bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshipped and gave praise to the Lord, saying, Truly He is good. Truly His loving kindness is everlasting. This is the place where God lived. I mean, it is hard to wrap my mind around this at times, but God dwelt and lived in here. This was His house. Upon recognizing it, it forced people to the ground with their faces on the pavement in worship. There was nothing ordinary about this. This was God moving throughout his people. In order to move about in this temple and do what was needed to be done, there was a set of ceremonial and sacrificial and priestly ordinances that were put into place that we could spend years studying together and still be plumbing the depths of them. But all of these were meant to set the people of Israel apart before a holy God, to prepare their hearts and bodies to worship the holy God. And the repetition of them year after year was supposed to help them recognize the coming Messiah who was the fulfillment and the substance of all that this foreshadowed. This was an amazing thing, to come to a building with God inside of it, to sit in his presence in a way that they just didn't have access to in other places. This is, this is a big deal. The Jews went through periods of pursuing this worship in both great awe and dependence on God, and then at other times, half-heartedness and, and, and sometimes non-existent worship. They would forget about God at certain times in place of worshiping idols and other gods. This led to points of their captivity, the temple's destruction, and ultimately, Herod would take on the great rebuild of the Temple of Jerusalem again in, in around 19 BC. It wouldn't be completed until 63 AD, which was about seven years before its destruction. So when Jesus was alive, his entire life, this temple was, was pretty much being built, right? But this was the place that the Jews, converts, pilgrims, worshiping Gentiles would gather to come to the presence of God. So Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Jesus had been going to that temple his entire life and in doing so this time, under the complete authority of his Father's will, in his timetable, it's going to be different. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their table. So every year, as Jews and pilgrims would head to this location, the place in which God established his name, his house where he dwelt, they would do so and bring their families, bring their acquaintances, everyone who would worship with them. And the journey would take a while. It would take lots of provision, lots of stuff, and they would have to bring their sacrifices with them to this place. And, um, and they would travel to this town of Jerusalem. Normally, Jerusalem had, uh, let's say, around 150,000 people. Estimations are 100,000, quarter million. But let's say there's 150,000 people living in the city of Jerusalem. This is a big city. But at the time of the feast, these numbers would swell up to a million and over. It would be full. A lot of people would come to worship God. So this would, this would swell the city. The city would feel the pressure of these people coming to it. They would know that the people of Israel, the worshipers of God, were there. It would be hard on them in certain ways, but they also found ways to prosper by renting rooms, selling necessities, boarding animals, and the list goes on. 
Luke 2, 41 through 49 gives us a picture of such a group traveling from Jerusalem after the Passover feast when Luke tells us about Jesus missing on the return journey from Passover when he was 12. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passovers. And when he became 12, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents were unaware of it but supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey and they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed and his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? There's a couple things to notice about this story. One is the sheer size of this caravan. To, to lose your son in a caravan for a day would mean that it's not tiny. He's not in the back seat, you know. He's, he's somewhere in this group of family and acquaintances. And this is how people would travel. I mean, just groups would descend on Jerusalem of this size. Big families. The other thing is, is Jerusalem was probably bustling and busy even after the feast. You couldn't just walk into Jerusalem and find somebody. You know, it, this was a big city. Lots of movement. The people observed the great money-making opportunities. And they set up shops along the Kidron Valley leading into Jerusalem so that people could begin to buy their sacrifices and their goods along the way. And though this may have started out as a convenience, it quickly turned into a racket. This market moved into the very temple itself, into the court of Gentiles, the court that was for Gentile worship of God. God was always giving access and allowance to Gentiles to come and worship him in the true way. The Jews did not much care for this ministry to the Gentiles. And I think that we could tell by the reality of them setting up this marketplace in their very place of worship. It was under the command and control of the the Jewish leadership itself. Beyond that, upon arriving at the temple, you would have to pay the temple tax. You'd have to pay it almost every stop along the way. You'd have to pay the temple tax. You'd have to pay for your animal to be inspected. And this temple tax um, had, and, and all of these payments had to be done with Jewish money. It was under a couple of excuses. One of them was that the Jewish people said, we don't want any graven images as defined in Exodus 24. The other is that the money was of higher quality. So they didn't want this other less qualitative money being put into their things. But they somehow found an exchange rate for it regardless And they somehow accepted coin and graven image regardless. And this was beyond the fact that Exodus 24 says, do not worship graven images. Don't have, it's not about the money. It's about the worship of the graven image. They clung to scripture here to make money as the exchange rate on this money transfer was outrageous. And they knew people would pay it to worship God. They would also deny the purity of the sacrifice brought from outside. So they had set up these shops and and, and they were selling these sacrifices at much higher rates, outrageous rates, on top of money they transferred and made money on. So you would go and you'd pay this priest to inspect your animal and he'd say, denied. But we have one of these pre-approved doves over here. You know, denied. But this lamb over here is blemish free and you can buy one from us. And that's how it would go. And people would ultimately stop bringing their own sacrifices. There's even record in Jewish history of them beginning to trade animals with money on top. That means they would take your failed animal and they would take a little extra money so that you could get a blemish free animal. Why would they take your animal? So they could sell it to someone a little further down the line as a pure animal. This was getting out of hand. 
So you would have to pay all of these things. And this was your very access to God. This was your, your ability to worship, your ability to sacrifice and atone for your sin. They knew people would pay whatever they were asked to. Josephus, the great Jewish historian, kind of captures the heart of this leadership when he says, the high priest Annas, after he had been relieved from his office to some degree, was respected and feared by the citizens, but in a bad way, for he loved to hoard money. He became good friends with Albinius and of the, of the newly installed high priest. He did so by offering them bribes. He also had wicked servants who associated with the most vilest sort of characters and went to the thrashing floors and took the tithes that belonged to the priest by force and beat anyone who would not give these tithes to them. So the other priests that followed him as well and his servants acted likewise without anyone being able to stop them. So, the, so that some of the priests, those who were old and were being supported by these tithes, died for lack of food. I think Isaiah captures the heart of this kind of worship in Isaiah 1, 10 through 15, when he says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assembly. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Ezekiel describes the glory of the Lord leaving the temple because of the lack of worship and because of worshiping of idols and false gods. Ezekiel 9, 3, 10, 18 through 19 and Ezekiel 11, 22 through 25 spells out Ezekiel's vision of this happening. Haggai 2, 3 through 9 reminds the people of the reality of the absence of God's glory but also makes them a promise. It says, Who is left among you who saw the temple in its former glory? How do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? But now, take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest and all you people of the land. Take courage, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. As for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and earth and the sea also and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and they will come with me, come with the wealth of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. We read of the beginning of this true fulfillment of that promise already in John 1, 14, when the beloved disciple says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The word used to describe the glory of God in this verse is the same word used to describe the glory of God that dwelt in the Holy of Holies in the temple and in the tabernacle. And it was the same glory that departed from the temple in Ezekiel. This is also the same glory promise that would fill the house in Haggai 7. And the glory that had arrived and began to dwell among us in John 1.14. And the same glory in which Paul speaks of believers having face-to-face connection. 2 Corinthians 3.16, when Paul compares our access to God's glory 
to that of the access of Moses. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Moses and Aaron had a veiled access to God. Aaron couldn't just walk into the Holy of Holies. He couldn't just do what he wanted in there. Leviticus 16.2 says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, or he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. It's an old covenant access that's superseded by the work and accomplishment of Jesus, delivering us into the new covenant of his blood. The old covenant marked and memorialized with the blood of the lamb on the, lint, of the, lamb on the lintels and the doorpost compared to the new covenant marked by the blood of Jesus on a cross. We go from no access to the holy place inside the veil to beholding as in a mirror the glory of God. Having just this brief understanding of the temple, I think, helps us move into what Jesus is about to do. What it means for him to clear a temple and what he meant when he said he's going to raise it up. It was intended to be the very house of God in which he would dwell alongside his people. Sometimes we have a hard time connecting to this. But, it, it, you know, we're coming into the glory of God. I, I get nervous sometimes when I'm going to see my dad, you know. But this is, this is beyond that. This is not your typical authority. This is the authority that makes you fall down on your face and worship. And in unholy instances, die. Sadly, this place Jesus, Jesus had seen all his life was a mockery of that reality. It was a marketplace, not a place of worship. And Jesus came in under his father's authority and timetable, and he went into action. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. So he makes a scourge. And that's basically a bunch of ropes wound up together. And there would be plenty of them as there's plenty of animals tied up in this place. He wraps them together. And it's not a weapon that can kill. But it can surely get an oxen moving. And it can surely get its handler moving out the door after it. But it, it's not going to kill anybody. But it's going to get some attention. And flipping over the tables and pouring out the money would get some attention. It would probably have money changers on their hands and knees trying to pick up coins as, you know, ripped off people were over there trying to pick up what they felt they were taken from before they all scooted on out of there. There's a lot of questions that come to mind when we're looking at this. Why didn't anyone stop him? It's estimated that there was about 250 or 300 Roman guards just in this temple. And they were surrounded by a huge garrison of Roman soldiers that looked into the temple. And any sort of outbreak or riot would come in and just get squashed. But no one did anything. What kind of righteous anger was this? The only way to see this event is as a miracle. One man driving out thousands of animals and money changers and merchants is a miracle. We can see that this event is miraculous. And um, regardless of the reality that he may have had a lot of support in what he was doing, a lot of people knew and understood that this, was a mock, that this was a mockery, what was happening here. This was injustice to God. There was probably a lot of people in support of what he was doing. But the reality was is Jesus didn't need anyone's support. He didn't need anyone's permission. He was acting righteously by the will of God. We know that he had power to slip out of large groups in extremely hostile situations. 
He escaped the multitudes in John 6 when they went to make him king after he went and made, multiplied the bread and water. And at his very voice and, and, and calling out who he was, Judas and Roman soldiers fell on their backs when he said, I am. There's lots of ways he could have controlled this crowd. So Jesus, this is John 18, 4, 4 through 9. And there's a couple things in this story that I want to look at. Some are obvious and some are subtle. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? Speaking to the Roman cohort coming to get him. They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. And he said, I am. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Therefore he asked, therefore he again asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these go their way to fulfill the word which he spoke of those whom you have given me. I lost none. There's the obvious part of this miracle, people falling on their backs at him saying, I am. And then him, there's him telling the, shol- the soldiers what they're going to do. Take me only and leave these alone. When Jesus had said, said this, We know that he's capable of doing this in a very miraculous way. But from the text, we don't get much more than and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. Drove out here is the same language used to describe Jesus driving out demons. Matthew 8.31 and Matthew 9.33. Pouring out here is the same language used of pouring out God's wrath as he flipped the tables over putting them out of business for at least a short time. It had become all too obvious that this place was no longer a temple, but a marketplace. And Jesus made it clear when he said, take these things away, stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. His disciples, and I'm sure many other people in the temple, knew their scripture. So when Jesus was doing this, this is what came to their mind and to their heart. This is what helped those recognize him as the Messiah. This is the recognition that leads to belief. Psalm 69.9 says, For zeal for thy house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach thee have fallen on me. Jesus was consumed with zeal for his father's house. And in a righteous display of power and holiness of God, Jesus clears the temple of merchants, animals, and money changers. He does so with a consumed zeal. This is a miraculous act that foreshadows what is to come, fulfills what was promised, and points to him as the Messiah. He has arrived. He is dwelling again among his people. And he continues to manifest his glory. The people had made his father's house a marketplace and a mockery. And this release of righteous judgment was acceptable, both because of the wickedness of the offense and the righteousness of the one giving the judgment. So let's pray, and we'll pick this up next week. Father, thank you so much for clearing the temple of our lives, Lord. Thank you so much for fulfilling everything that was promised. Thank you for helping us recognize who you are and being a part of every aspect of us kneeling down and worshiping you. We pray to understand what that means in a deeper and more colorful way every single day, Lord. Pray that you help us to know what it means to be your temple and how we should act and live being the vessel that carries you out into the world. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. (laughs) You weren't ready for me to be done, were you?